MedCram. Okay, well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. Today we're going to talk about pulmonary embolism. And specifically, we're going to talk about the epidemiology and also the risk factors. In the next lectures, we'll talk about other things, for instance, the uh, diagnosis and treatment. But let's talk about pulmonary embolism, its epidemiology, risk factors, things of that nature. First of all, what is a pulmonary embolism? Well, to look at this, we've got to look at the relationship between the heart and the lungs. As we know, we've got the heart, which pumps blood to the lungs, and also the left side, which pumps blood to the rest of the body. And on each side, we've got the lungs. which sits uh, on the left and the right. Now, of course, we know that the venous system, not only from the bottom, but also from the top, drains into the right side of the heart. And from there, from the right atrium, it goes to the right ventricle. And the right ventricle pumps blood specifically to the lungs. Because of this, any blood clot in any vein is eventually going to end its way up, if it breaks forth, into the right side. Now, because of that, the right side of the heart pumps this clot into the pulmonary arteries. And because the pulmonary artery gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, that blood clot is going to get caught in the lungs and uh, get lodged, and that's what's known as pulmonary embolism. Now, typically, because blood flow typically goes more to the lower part of the lung than it does the upper part of the lung, and that's a result of gravity, more or less, because of this, you're going to see more pulmonary embolisms in the lower portion of the lungs and less in the upper. Of course, it can happen anywhere, but just as a general rule, since more blood flow goes to the lower portion of the lungs, you're going to tend to see more blood clots lodging in the lower portion of the lungs. Now, is there any predilection as to what side they tend to go on? No, the answer is not really. But it's possible for it to actually get stuck in the middle where the pulmonary artery branches. That's known as a saddle embolus. And that can be fatal, obviously, because of the large amount of blood flow that gets disturbed in a, that type of pulmonary embolism. Okay, so what is the incidence of pulmonary embolism? Believe it or not, it's about 600,000 people per year get a pulmonary embolism. And this results in anywhere between 50,000 and... 200,000 deaths per year. That's a lot of people. And so I think this is an important diagnosis to talk about. Okay, now that you know what they are, let's talk a little bit about them in general. First of all, we miss them a lot. What do I mean by that? We miss them a lot. They happen a lot in the emergency room and in the hospital, and we fail to pick them up because we don't realize this. And how do we know that we miss them a lot? Because of autopsies. Okay, we see them on autopsies and we didn't even think that the patient would have had them. We also test for these a lot. And what happens is they're negative. So we think that they're there and we test and they don't turn out to be positive. And in other cases, we don't even think about them. And on autopsy, we see pulmonary embolism. What does that tell you? It tells you that we're not doing a good job of picking these things up. And it's probably one of the most misdiagnoses in the hospital. Where do these things come from? Well, most pulmonary embolisms are from deep venous thromboses. And most pulmonary embolisms from deep venous thromboses come from the lower extremities above the knee. So they're in 
the legs above the knee. That's where we need to start looking for these things. So well, what is the pathophysiology? The pathophysiology specifically is, is that these blood clots form down in the legs because of a number of possible risk factors. They break off. They go up the inferior vena cava to the right atrium, to the right ventricle, and then they lodge themselves in the lungs. Now, what happens there? When the blood clot gets lodged in the pulmonary artery, there is no more perfusion to that area of the lung. And so what you're getting there is ventilation without perfusion, and that is basically dead space. And more forward is that the blood that should have gone to that area then has to get diverted to other areas of the lung, and then you get an increased flow of blood to the other areas. And so the major mechanism is VQ mismatch. If you have any questions about the mechanism of VQ mismatch, please see our hypoxia lectures and the mechanisms of hypoxemia. Now, you also get increase in resistance to blood flow, especially on the right side specifically, and that can cause cardiac arrest. In some situations, you can actually get the lungs to infarct about 10% of the time. Uh, it's difficult because there's a dual blood supply, as many of you know. The lungs have a dual blood supply. We know that the pulmonary artery goes to the lungs with deoxygenated blood. Okay, so deoxygenated blood goes to the lungs that way. But also, the aorta, which is coming off from the left side of the heart, also sends branches over to the lung. And so it's difficult to infarct the lung uh, completely. Okay, so let's talk about risk factors. What are the risk factors for pulmonary embolism? Now, the reason why this is important, as we'll talk about later, is that there is no test for pulmonary embolism that you would order in another situation and accidentally pick up a pulmonary embolism. What do I mean by this? I mean, the only way you're ever going to make a diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism is if you order a very specific test looking for pulmonary embolism. And what does that mean? That means if you're not thinking about pulmonary embolism, you'll never really make the diagnosis. So it's very easy to miss it. So what are the things that should clue you in that this is a pulmonary embolism? Well, it's risk factors. So what are some of the risk factors? One, it would be an orthopedic procedure. Okay, so what do I mean by that? We're talking hip replacements, knee replacements, or repair of fractures. These sorts of procedures cause patients to not only be laid up in bed, but also the endothelial damage that occurs during these surgeries, and the fact that these patients probably haven't been moving around very much in the preceding days to weeks before this procedure. So if somebody has an orthopedic procedure and comes down with symptoms of tachycardia and tachypnea, as we'll talk about, then you need to think about a pulmonary embolism. Number two, patients without prophylaxis. What do I mean by prophylaxis? This is like DVT prophylaxis. Well, the things that we're thinking about in hospitalized patients would be bilateral lower extremity sequential compression devices or anticoagulants. Things like heparin, Lovenox, warfarin, things of that nature. Even things during surgery. So these are all possibilities. What's another risk factor? Number three, abdominal or pelvic surgery, especially if it's done for cancer. So cancer or abdominal pelvic surgery could increase the risk and does increase the risk. Number four, obesity.
increases the risk. Number five, women greater than 30 years of age and they are on OCPs and they're smokers. This is a serious combination right here that you shouldn't forget. I've seen personally in the intensive care unit. In fact, in one month, I saw two women over the age of 30 on oral contraceptives who were smokers and they had problems. They had pulmonary embolism so bad that in fact, they ended up on a ventilator. Number six, hypercoagulable state. Okay, what do I mean by this? Things, for instance, like protein C and S deficiencies. So you can have one or the other. Uh, that's a, a possible risk factor. Another possibility would be something like factor five, Leiden. That's another type of hypercoagulable state. And finally, the last one would be pregnancy. Okay, so think about these things when we are trying to think whether or not a patient may have a pulmonary embolism because these risk factors certainly could be involved. Okay, what about the symptoms? What would be the symptoms or the clinical findings? Well, the first one is a high heart rate known as tachycardia. And the first thing you'll notice is that that is very nonspecific. Number two is just as bad, and that's tachypnea. These things here are very nonspecific and can be seen in a number of diseases, like pneumonia, like a myocardial infarction, for instance. So you have to be specific and circumspect when you're looking at these uh, because these can fit into many different categories. Hemoptysis, or coughing up a blood, especially if there is a lung infarction. That's a possible clinical finding. Also, signs of pulmonary hypertension. So what are those types of signs? Well, you'd sometimes see elevated liver function tests, or you would see an increase in the sound of a P2 on auscultation. You might also see uh, signs of right ventricular hypertrophy, both on palpation and also on the EKG. So these are signs and symptoms of pulmonary uh, embolism, some of the clinical findings. Join us for the next lecture when we start to talk about, in terms of pulmonary embolism, the diagnostic modalities. So how do we figure out whether or not this patient really does have a pulmonary embolism. It's going to be an interesting discussion. Thanks.